We're here today with Erilis Hunter, who's one of the finalist authors um, in the um, Easter Glen um, uh, Junior Fiction Award um, uh, Prize for the, um, the Wright Family Foundation. Um, and Erilis' um, book in the finalist category this year is The Uprising, The Met Makers and Crucia. Um, and Erilis is going to be sharing a um, writing workshop with us about maps and stories. Um, just before we start, just a, a thank you to the sponsors this year, so the New Zealand Book Awards Trust and the Library and Information Association of New Zealand Aotearoa uh, for making the event possible. Um, and also thank you to um, Erilis's um, publisher, to Geeko Press as well. Um, so we'll hand it over to Erilis. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Uh, hi, Holswell School. It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> um, right, I'm, <clears throat> we're going to have a, a workshop about maps and stories, and I'm going to start by my own two most recent books are about a family of map makers, and they both have maps in. I'm going to tell you about a bit about them, and then we'll look at some of the maps in these and in some other books, four other books. And then I'll read you a bit from the map uprising um, while you start drawing your own map, okay? Don't start drawing yet. I wrote about a family of map makers because I love maps and I always have since I was young. These books are set in a world where there's, there's a bit steampunk. There's no cars, no electricity. You can see for, the children here at the bottom there and you see a rather steampunky looking transport there. In the first book here, The Map Makers Race, the family have entered a map making competition to race across a mountainous wilderness but the children temporarily lose their mother so they have to race without her because they really really need the prize money. So it's a story of their trek across the mountains and what happens. In the new book, this one, whoops, back a bit. In the new book, The Uprising, the children have got their mother back and they're searching for their father who failed to return from his last expedition. They go to a town called Crucia, the last place their father was known to be. That's how they got there in that dirigible. It's a town in trouble and the land in the, the town depends on the precious fertile valley is under threat. Now here are some other maps. I was very thrilled when Gecko, my publisher, agreed that the, my books needed maps. But the question was, what should they look like? Um, we looked together, we looked at some examples of maps in other books. This one is from, you probably might recognize it from Pooh Bear. This is the 100 acre wood. And it shows the, the it shows that Piglet's house, Pooh's house, Eel's house, where everyone lives and the dotted lines of the paths in between their houses. You could walk across that map in half an hour. This map is from, this map is of Moomin Valley where the Finn family Moomin Troll live and have their adventures. And it would take a lot longer than half an hour to walk across that. That's a, that's a several days worth of adventures and places that they go. And down in the right bottom right hand corner, you might be able to see a map or a, a plan of their house, the two floors of the house in which the Moomins live. The Moomin Trolls live. And this map shows the Moomin, um, the map of Fontania, where several a series of books by Barbara Else is set. This map would take several days to get across by boat. Um, that's one of the pictures from there. Now the story of the map makers race is a journey. So we didn't actually need to show a whole country. I didn't know what the whole country looked like even. So 
I just knew what the children could see as they went on their, they found a route through the wilderness. So I'm not an artist. And so I just had to draw the best I could about, which you'll see is not very good. <laughs> Right, that's the, that is the first map that I drew. As you can see, you could, I'm sure you could all do better. This is the town of Grand Prospect up one side with the river prospect running past it. The road to the mountains is which the, where the other teams went. And this route is the route that the Santander children took. And this is what the marvelous illustrator Kirsten drew when she went out from my from my little sketch. She got the town here and the river. There are factories and there's forest and there's the route they took. And that is the Wait For Me stream. The children named everything as they made their maps. And you're going to do that too. But when we did the second book, we did need the whole whole area shown, not just it was because it, it wasn't just a journey. The whole area, the whole of the Upper Valley is important to this story. So in this in this pit map here that Kirsten drew from my another very um, basic sketch, she put in mountains. You see mountains. This is how you can show mountains and the river wiggling down here to the plain. This area is forest and here's Crucia and a sacred place called Mina Mandawa. This shows where North is. And this area here is all the places that are, that are cultivated by the people who live there. She also managed to make the illustrations of the town and the places that they were into maps. Here you can see the marketplace at the, at the bottom of the map. And then the dotted line shows the route that the family took when they were searching for a hotel to stay in. And that's the Falcon Hotel at the top. And this map or illustration shows the route Sal was running when she was being chased by the custodians who were like the police of Crucia later on in the story. Now, this is the last map I'm going to ask you to look at before you start to draw your own. It's a map of Skeleton Island. It was drawn a long time ago, 1881, by the writer Robert Louis Stevenson to entertain his son Lloyd, his stepson Lloyd, who was 12. And it was a wet holiday they were having in Scotland. So they sat down together to make a map. And they drew this map of Skeleton Island and put on, together they decided what they wanted to put on it. There's a stockade on it, uh, graves, a wreck, two swamps and the were a red cross and the word here I don't know if you can see that and the words bulk of treasure here. Stevenson and Lloyd then went on to make up the beginning of the story which he Stevenson Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Treasure Island a famous book about pirates the first big book about pirates for children and this is where Long John Silver, the one-legged pirate with a parrot on his shoulder, the idea of X marks the spot and yo-ho-ho, -ho, this is where it all started. Because this is an example of where maps can tell stories and stories can grow from maps. So now it's your turn to be map makers and to see if you can grow a story at the same time. I'd like you to just get your turn around now to your, to your desks and draw an outline 
of a map, an island. Take up most of your piece of paper, just draw an outline to start with. Be quick and doesn't, doesn't have to be fussy. And before you put in any details, we'll just talk about the symbols and languages of maps. For instance, forest is usually covered or bush is usually colored green, as you probably know. A river is usually a squiggly blue line and a dotted line for a path. A building could be a little black square or a small picture of the building. You can invent your own symbols to show to show things on the map. So in the map makers race, Kirsten marked the Santander children's campsites on the maps with a little tiny fire. The important thing is that you also make a key to explain anything that you show, the, the symbols that you use on your map. Unless there's no room for a key on the same page, you can do it on a separate piece of paper, that's fine. Okay, and now we're going to start Draw, draw a safe landing place on your map. This, mark where you mark where you land, and think about the scale of your of your island. Can you walk across this island in half an hour, or will it take days? Now imagine that your island, the place that you've landed, it, look around, what can you see? Are there going to be mountains? Are there going to be forest? Is it actually quite a small island and quite friendly? You're gonna have an adventure there. And I want to think, you to think about why you're there. Are you coming to find someone or find something? Are you coming to explore it? Are you coming for a holiday? Keep that thought about why you've come to this island in the back of your head whilst we develop a story and an adventure. You've got your list now. I will read through it of, well, you're getting your list, of the place, places that you might put on all of them or none of, or some of them or maybe even none of them. If you're going to have an adventure, I'll just read them to you. And then I'm going to read from my book whilst you draw. So you've got your safe landing place. What sort of landscape is it? You've thought about that a little bit. Hills, mountains, jungle, bush. I want you to think of at least two dangerous threats that you're going to have to avoid or overcome by using your brain to get out of danger. So it could be something like a cliff or a volcano or a raging river you have to cross. It could be something you make up like a fire swamp. And maybe you can have a threat from something that's alive. Is this a place with wild animals or you know, a dragon or a dinosaur. Or it could be human, human threats, human baddies on this island. Someone who wants the same thing that you're there for. Or wants you to stop having it. When you're on an island, you, you need somewhere where you can get a good view from to look all around, especially if there's dangers. So. Mark a good viewpoint place. Perhaps it's the top of top of the mount, of a mountain or a hill or even the top of a tree. And then some other ideas are somewhere to shelter from, from if there's a big bad storm. Somewhere that's safe. On Skeleton Island, there's a stock that the, some of the characters found an abandoned stockade, which they hid in. 
is your island inhabited by other people? If it is, it'll need some paths, maybe roads and buildings. Are there any rivers or lakes? And don't forget to name places. You can name the highest point and some of the other landmarks. And you can color forested areas in green and beaches could be yellow and you could use other colors to show other things that you wanted to show. And now I'm going to leave you doing that and I'm going to read from the uprising, the map makers in Crucia. Joe had been fiddling with his pocket knife when Francie appeared with Walter Watkins' drawing pad under her arm and gestured at the window. Joe stood up. Ma, can me and Francie explore the garden? If you promise to stay in the hotel grounds. Francie nodded approval at Joe. She never spoke, but he usually knew what she was thinking and feeling. They're twins, by the way. Outside, they crossed the gravel path to a bench seat and she opened the sketchbook across their laps. The drawing of a landscape covered both pages. There was a mountain range in the background with a deep valley running, running into it. In the middle of the valley was a hemispherical hill covered in trees and nearby a town of towering buildings on another hill. To one side was a market with stalls and animals. And sitting on a rock in the foreground with a mug in his hand was Pa. Positively, definitely Pa. Ma must have flicked straight past it, said Joe softly. And Francie nodded. So now we need to find out where this is. They grinned at each other. They showed the picture to the man at the reception desk, but he only shrugged and so did the woman polishing the stair rail. Two men crossed the lobby and entered a room on the far side. The sign on the door said, smoking room. Joe looked at Francie, who was trying to be braver about people. What is them? She nodded, but he could feel her worry pulsing out. He gestured, ears, and she pulled back her hair to show that she'd already stuffed them with cotton wool. Loud noises terrified Francie. The room was almost silent. Newspapers rustled softly as their pages were turned and people spoke in murmurs. The loudest noise was a chink of ice in the glass and then, and then a match was struck to keep a pipe alight. Pipe and cigar smoke hung in a pall above people's heads. I should remind you that this is set a hundred years, more than a hundred years ago, this book. The smoke stung Joe's eyes and smelt horrible. Several people glanced up at them with disapproval, Joe felt Francie tense up, but she followed close behind as he tiptoed across the thick carpet. He spoke quietly to the men sitting around a table. Excuse me, but would any of you know where this is? He pointed at the book Francie held open. One man said, no idea, sorry. And the others shrugged and shook their heads. The people in the high backed sofas by the window didn't know either. When the group behind the potted palms also shrugged, Francie held up a hand to Joe. She pulled a pencil from her hair and found an empty page. Her hand flew over the paper until she'd made a copy of the map Ma had bought, at the, of, bought yesterday. Francie had only looked at it for a couple of minutes, but she'd remembered the roots, the settlements, and even some of the names. Joe's twin was brilliant. She drew a careful question mark in the corner, then held up the picture pointing and raising her eyebrows. Francie was an expert at communicating without words. A woman in a feathery hat murmured to an elderly man with a long gray beard. He squinted his watery eyes at the map and the picture. And finally, he took Francie's pencil and with shaking fingers circled a town on her map. He gestured to the town in the picture. Crucia, he said, this is Crucia. Joe took the pencil and wrote C-R-O-O-S-H-A. The man shook his head and wrote C-R-U-X-C-I-A. Crucia, thank you, said Joe. He squeezed Francie's hand and said, thank you, thank you again. One or two people even smiled at them. Excuse me, said a slimy voice. It was the short man who had stared at them in the map shop. 
He was sitting at the bar with the tall woman. The tips of his moustache pointed to his ears. May I look? Joe felt Francie fizzle with fear, which he didn't understand. The man made him angry. No, he said. I'm afraid it's private. And they ran upstairs to tell Maya and the others that they'd found out where they needed to go next. So that's how they found out that they needed to go to Crucia. I'll just read the beginning of, an, of the next bit where they get into their dirigible, their dirigible, and, and they set off. And then we're going to have some time for questions in a little while. Okay, so you can be thinking of questions if you've got any questions about the books or about map making, I suppose, in a minute. Ma had refused to tell them how they were going, getting to Crucia, saying it was a sp special surprise and she was sure they'd love it. The queue shuffled forward slowly. Then before long, they were outside. Ahead of Sal, people were climbing a flight of steps, steps lit by, lan lit by lantern. Steps to what? Sal craned her neck to make out a vast whale shape, basking in the air high above them. Holy moly, she whispered. Humphrey hid his face in her back. What is it? Sal is 14, by the way, and Humphrey's the little brother. So that's the family, Sal. Joe and Francie, who are 11, now 12, and um, Humphrey, who is five. I think it's a dirigible, said Sal. We're going on an airship. The dirigible was tethered to a tower. The queue stretched up the steps to the landing stage. This was just too exciting and very scary. Though Ma seemed completely calm. She went first up the steps across a gangway that bobbed and wobbled into the boat that hung underneath the giant balloon. It was like a cross between a ferry and a sharabang, with two rows of bench seats facing forward, three people to a seat, and a walkway down the middle. Twelve rows, 72 people. Sal, Sal counted automatically. A woman wearing the fly, oh, flying suit looked at their tickets and pointed to the bench that spanned the back of the boat. So lucky they'd be able to sit together and watch the world disappear behind them but there was nothing to stop them or their things from falling overboard. Sal could already feel her worry warring with a thrill of viewing the world from above. She squeezed Humphrey's arm and made him look at her. No leaning over, not even a finger past the rail, understand, or you'll be dead. He nodded, eyes huge. They sat as still as they could in their seats and watched four uncooperative sheep and crates of chickens being loaded into storage below their deck. The sky began to lighten in the east and gradually the night turned from black to gray. Humphrey peered cautiously over the back. Sal, Sal, there's giant birds. Three strange objects with outstretched wings were poised beside the landing strip. They did look like giant birds. They had letters painted on their tails. Sal squinted, GTC. Those must be ornithopters, said Ma. They're for transport. One day we might go on one. A man on the platform blew a whistle. The door in the boat's side was closed and bolted and the gangway pulled back onto the landing stage. Sal had been watching a smudge of dust move along the road from Port of Pearls. It was a four-horse carriage driving at speed toward the Embarcation Tower. As the tethering ropes fell away, the airship quivered and shuddered beneath her and slowly began to rise. Below, two figures, one tall, the other short, scrambled out of the carriage and ran to, towards the steps. Too late for them. The dirigible was on its way. So if you want to know who the tall man, woman and the short man are, and what they have to do with the story of Crucia, you'll have to read the book. And now, should we have some questions first? And then whilst the rest of you, or how are you getting on with your maps? Perhaps I should ask that first. 
do perhaps one of you, one or two of you want to come and show me your maps, how, you, how you've got on? Is there anybody who's, who would like to show me? I can see a hand up at the back. Would you like to come? Um, I'm not really great at drawing, so this might not be as good. <laughs> you know how bad I am. I've shown you. You like, show me your map. Like. Oh, wow. I can see mountains. I can see hills. Water kingdom, does that say? Oh, my goodness. You've done heaps. Pipe king, fire kingdom. You've got a, a water kingdom and a fire kingdom. And an earth kingdom and magic clouds. Wow, that's very exciting. I'm sure you'll be able to write a really good story about the adventure you have when you go to this island. Have you got a name for the whole island? I can't quite read it, it's at the top. Can you can you read me what it says? The name of the whole island? Um, yeah. I, I haven't had a name for the island yet. You haven't, okay. Well, you make up a name for it. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Yay. Somebody else, show me. <laughs> What's your name? Georgia. I couldn't hear that. You have to say it louder. I'm sorry. With masks on, it's really difficult to hear. Georgia. Can you can you put it put it near the camera um, at all? Do you think? Because it's yeah. quite your your right. Ah, oh, that's good. Oh, you're doing some good detail down. That's a peaceful forest. Willow, Willow's house. That's, oh, that's a lovely, lovely, yes. Death City. Oh, there's certainly a big threat on your island, isn't there? Wow. Can you, re can you read one or two of the things for me? So that, because I, I can't quite read the rest. Oh, quicksand, I can see. Shark Town. Yeah. Shark Town. Oh, avoid that. What else? Volcano Brothers. <laughs> Three volcanoes in a row and hot quicksand pond. Be careful there. Well, that's full of excitement. You can think of it, lots of adventures. You could have a whole series of adventures there. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, does anybody have a... Oh, one more, one more map to look at. Okay, let's have a look. What can I see? Mountains of mystery. And what does that say? The village. What's your village? Something of oh, something valley. Village. The docks. The docks village. And can you tell me? Pull it back a little bit now towards you, so we can see the whole thing. That's an interesting, sh nice shape that you've got to the whole of the whole thing. And what's the what's the name on the bottom? Of the things on on the on your by your left hand, can you bring that nearer? Yeah, up a bit. What does that say? Claw, Claw Island. Whoa! I can imagine all kinds of things happening there, and I hope you can too. I'm sure you can. So you'll be able to write a story, starting with with your adventures on that island. Why did you go there? Did you think of a reason you were going there? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, so Thank you very much. Things to, uh, to improve on and kind of add and extra layers to it, isn't it? Yeah, lots of things you can you can you can keep working on. Whilst we've got a little little bit of time left, have any of you got any questions about my books? I, he I heard that one of you had read them. Is that right? <laughs> Have you? <laughs> can you take your, can you come and stand up and face me so you can take your mask off for a minute so we can talk to you properly? <laughs> can you take your mask off so we can hear you? Sorry, what's your name? Uh, Owen. Owen. Oh, nice to meet you, Owen. So did you have any questions about the books? Um. How do you get the idea for maps? Well, partly it was because when I was a kid, the one 
thing I wanted more than anything else in the world. My superpower that I really, really wanted was to be able to fly. And so I used to, if you, if you could fly, it would be a bit like looking down on the world, like making, like having a map in your head, wouldn't it? It's, it's, it's a close relationship being able to fly and, and, and looking down at a map. And so I've always loved books with maps in, and I've always loved the, the being able to tell, make up a story from looking at maps. In the in the in the books, the maps I do draw. I did sort of get a rough idea of what was happening by drawing the maps, and then wrote more story around them as I went. Hmm. Which is your favourite book? Which do you prefer? The second one. The second one. Why do you think that is? Uh, I feel like it's got a better plot. <laughs> a better plot. There's a lot that happens. It's a bit more complicated, isn't it? The first one, it's just a, it's a journey. I won't say just a journey, but it is a journey. It tells how to get from one place to the next, but how they went from one place to the next place to the next place. And who's your favourite character? Are you the same age? How old are you? Uh, 10. 10. Yeah, he's 11. And then he's 12. But yeah, same sort of age. That's great. Thank you. Has any of the rest of you, do you want to sit down again? Do any of the rest of you have any questions or anything? <laughs> so, sorry, it's really, it's really hard for me. Yeah, thank you. How did yeah. You get into writing? Say that again. How did you get into writing books? I'm getting into writing. Oh, I used to love writing. I used to write all sorts of things when I was young, but I also write, always used to like writing stories, thinking about stories, dreaming stories, not even always writing them, just thinking them. But when my, I was a teacher for a, not for very long, when my youngest child was ready to go to kindergarten, I thought, oh my goodness, I've either got to go back to writing, uh, back to teaching, and I've got four children at home, and that's enough. I don't really want to spend my day teaching as well, or I've got to make a go of being a writer. So I set myself a target to stop writing th and thinking sto up stories just for my own pleasure and for my children, about to write something that would get published. So I did. And you will find some of my stories and plays in school journals and in, um, oh, I wrote lots of other books, which lots of, of them, which are not in print anymore, but you might find them in libraries still. They're not in bookshops. Huh? Yeah, thank you. All right, I think we're, unfortunately we are out of time, but it's been um, really great. We've all enjoyed um, listening to you talk about maps and learning how to create an awesome map and, and hopefully write a story from that. And um, we'll um, hopefully be able to send you some of our finished maps that you can. Oh, have. I'd love to see them. Yes, and the stories as well, if they get written. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alice, for joining us at Hoswell School today. Um, and um, we wish you all the best in the book awards. Thank um, you very much. Of course, everybody else who's watching, make sure you go out and grab a copy of Alice's new book, The Map, The Uprising, The Map Makers in Crucia, um, from uh, either from good bookshops or from libraries. Lots of school libraries have them now and public libraries, of course. So um, we look forward to um, reading it. Great. Great. Well, Thanks.